Okay. All right. So thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today and being a part of this. We appreciate our uh, four panelists for today who are here to talk about just their reflections and lessons learned from pandemic teaching and uh, what things you would like to keep and what things you think are um, exciting ways that you might have engaged with students or done something differently that would be uh, useful for moving forward. So I feel like this is like we're, we're at that point of like it's good to think about this now and reflect since it's still fresh because um, uh, I, I do feel like there's there's some good things that came out of this and it's good to be able to kind of think through those and share those so that we can uh, kind of keep some of the, the momentum from some of this from moving forward. So um, we have our four panelists today. I will introduce them all. We have Dr. Sarah Portway um, with us will be going first and then uh, Kim Griswold will be going second and then Dr. Elizabeth Small third and Katsi Spithoff will be going fourth and we thank all four of you for being here today um, and with that I will turn it over Sarah to you so thank you very much Sarah for being a part of this. Thanks for having me it's a uh, it's a delight I love to share little takeaways so um, I'm really happy and I have a laundry list of like little little takeaways, uh, but in watching my colleagues on Tuesday, they they hatched out a lot of good stuff, and I can't do a better job than them. So I'm I tried to kind of cherry pick a couple of things, but the first thing I wanted to share was a mindset that I hope to take away. So more of an umbrella for of thinking, and so as you do during a pandemic, you have a little more time. And so I was digging through a closet. I have a, a few, it's a, it's a Victorian house, so they're all tiny. <laughs> and I found, I came across this article. So I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, so there's my dad, the original computer nerd. They called him the internet man. And he was actually the person who brought the internet to my part of the world for the first time. And so I wanted to share a few quick excerpts for you. Um, and this is, early 90s, uh, as you will know. So uh, Portway, whose system is called Muskoka.net Incorporated, says Gravenhurst will join an estimated 30 million users worldwide and be able to access public data, including university and school information. So 30 million users on the internet at this time. And here's this guy in a small podunk town in the middle of nowhere, Northern Ontario, I'm Canadian, um, doing this. A couple of other quotes that stood out was that he was actually already providing internet to the Muskoka District School Board at that time. And so, you know, these were young kids that were wired up right away, thanks to this guy. Um, so, you know, he says, you don't need a computer nerd to use the system. I have kids on the network 10 years old and people up to their 70s, which considering how many people learned Zoom this year, that really rings true. And the last kind of quote from this article was uh, users will be able to access information in the public domain, uh, including software, libraries, graphic programs, and even the Harvard Medical School. So um, Ed's saying that he loves the three computers. What you can't tell here, Ed, is uh, we owned a family restaurant. This is the basement, and there's an entire line behind him of computers as well, because he ran this bulletin board system, and you could watch people log in. They dialed up through, like, you know, the internet, um, and, you know, all around him, he's surrounded by computers pretty much at all times, at all hours of the night. So, um, so a mindset of embracing change and maybe going with the flow and thinking forward into the future like if this guy could predict exactly what was going to happen today 30 years ago I think that's a really interesting mindset to keep that we don't know what's going to happen you know um, the internet was only 30 million users so that's really interesting um, here's me right here very angry 13 year old Sarah ripped jeans and all um get earning the first uh, Christopher Portway, mem unfortunately, Memorial Technology Award. And then here's me later in high school, better able to pick an outfit um, here. That's me, uh, you know, uh, pr giving the award. And then there's my speech. I couldn't believe this packet of paper is awesome. My speech. And it is all about adapting and learning and pushing ourselves and getting better with technology. So... That was a mindset that I had that I brought with me, you know, like these were there were there were pioneers in this that allowed us to continue to communicate with our students to keep our jobs, 
you know, for them to stay connected to us, to continue learning and growing when, quite frankly, they had time to. Uh, maybe not the mental headspace, but they had time to, you know, be on the internet and we were all there. So I guess the one big takeaway that wasn't covered on Tuesday is the mindset that we came through a tough time. We saw the future. We walked through doors instead of focusing on the windows that closed. And I'd like to take that mindset with me into, into the next phase of whatever this is, if I can hold it. <laughs> um, so in a more practical kind of share, uh, a more, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. I'm gonna share an assignment that I gave to my freshman students that I thought went really, really well. So, um, so I'm gonna open it up for myself too. It should be being sent in the chat right now. Some of them say that uh, it says some of the people will need access later. So I'll just open it up then and share my screen. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that my freshman class struggled with was it was a big class and nobody had their cameras on. It was hard to even know like how many people are in this room? <laughs> I'm sure some of you can kind of relate to that. So um, bear with me. I'm just uh, getting used to the new share screen here. Okay. Window. Oh boy. Come on now. There we go. Okay. So here is an exploded version of the assignment. Hold on. Um, if you do choose to use that assignment, you'll notice that it's already set up ADA compliant. So, um, so you know, you ready for Blackboard. So it, the, the trouble is that it's a pretty long description, but it really helped students. So they did a case study three different times. If you're not familiar, case studies come from the Harvard Business School model, uh, but we have them for fashion students specifically. I'm a contributor to the fashion business cases through Bloomsbury. And so what it does is it gives a business scenario, some fictitious, some real, gives you a dilemma and asks students to solve it. So I used to do this as a paper assignment and I, I still do, uh, but it was actually, I was really disappointed in the solutions. The recommendations that students came to tended to be pretty flimsy if there was a recommendation at all. And I found that they were not necessarily um, comfortable kind of researching the problem, bringing some ev evidence in and then solving that problem with some sort of big solution. Here and there I'd get something great, pretty rare. Um, so this is what I did and I piloted it with freshmen, which seemed really bold at the time. So um, there were leaders, they did it three times. They had to lead one and participate in two. So there were groups of three. So they, um, they all had separate due dates. Discussions would last between 10 and 15 minutes. So I kept them short because these were freshmen. I've adapted this for older students or for upper division students, I should say, um, you know, with a longer time frame discussion groups they'll change and everyone needed to read the case they had to meet with their cameras on <laughs> with nothing private so this was another takeaway i had the opportunity in covid to explain what's a professional behavior online don't be in your bed don't have dirty dishes behind you don't be in a moving vehicle right these are all things we've learned uh don't be curling your hair <clears throat> don't be whatever it is you do. So during um, this discussion, they also had to think about professionalism. They had to use Microsoft Teams. What if someone didn't communicate? I was able to see that because they had to communicate on Microsoft Teams. And so I was able to tell my students like, don't stress about it. I can see who's not participating and they'll earn the grade they earn. So um, that was another feature of this assignment that worked really well because it took the, the stress off my students very much. They were like, oh, my grade's not tied to that other person. Uh, so I also had to give them directions for submitting their video link to Blackboard, not to upload the whole video because that will take up all of our, our quota, right, Chilton? I can, he I can hear you nodding right now. Discussion leaders um, used instructions. I gave them lots of clickable links. This was probably over explaining. And so next round, I will try to tighten this up. I think sometimes I have a tendency to like give them everything they need and that almost makes them think it's gonna be more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I gave them what are open-ended questions, what are closed-ended questions and directions for participants. And did everyone need to submit their <laughs> video separately? Yes, because <laughs> that's just what they needed to do. So here was my rubric. Um, and it's in there as well. So, you know, you can see quality of prepared 
things like facilitation, professionalism, you know, business question response. Here was the discussion um, participant evaluation. So two separate evaluations. So here's what was great about this. Far more creative answers, far more creative. And I got to get to know my students. A lot of them I had never seen their face before. And now not only was I seeing their face, I was hearing their voice, hearing their ideas, hearing how they took in the case study, what course concepts they were bringing in. And then also, um, you know, they created more clever recommendations amongst themselves because they had that creative energy happening in the group. And I could hear my students answering questions that they might not have ever asked me, like, you know, things that I find uh, like so, for example, one student was like, what's thrift shopping? And I was kind of like, what? <laughs> but a student was like, oh, it's this. And I was like, oh, OK, maybe I didn't fully explain that. So these were some of the great takeaways. I found this assignment really effective. I loved being able to watch their videos and I found that it was a really great way to get to know my students. Um, and also their their the way they dealt with this was much better and most of them got A's. So there was also that maybe I was just in a good mood. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that is that is my little my little takeaway, a mindset and one assignment that you could take with you. Sarah, was that the first assignment in the class? Uh, the, the assignment was structured into three separate modules. Uh, so with um, three, we dealt with three chapters in each and three modules. Each module ended with a non-cumulative exam, which isn't really my style, but for freshmen, it, it works for that remember Bloom's taxonomy piece. Yeah. And, you know, they need those foundations. And this was more my like higher level thinking that also ended, like also concluded an assignment. Okay. So or included a module and it it I picked my case studies to reflect the what we had just covered. You Got know. It. Yeah, they were always related like we did a sizing one when we did the sizing and fit chapter. We did an assortment planning one when we did a merchandise like product development. So I was I able to find some. Nice it. Yeah, good. All right, that's my 10. All right, uh, let's see uh, who is going to be next. Um, I think it's me, Kim, right? Yep, Kim, yes. <laughs> hey. Hi, everybody. Well, I have to say that, you know, this is actually one of the, the my favorite takeaways from this year is that I need to make sure that um, collaboration for me and for my students is a really big piece of uh, what I continue to do after uh, this pandemic because uh, prior to the you know the pandemic i wanted to go to the teaching and learning breakfast um but it was really hard to get there to take the time to walk up to hunt union and you know try to get back so for me you know being able to just hop online this became my lifeline and i learned so much during this pandemic so personally and um and professionally i just felt like i became uh, so much of a better instructor so so my takeaways all center around collaboration, reflection, flexibility, and engagement. So I would say that, um, you know, for my students, um, you know, I saw, you know, a lot of increased, uh, you know, collaboration and engagement in classes, being able to kind of increase the, um, the ability to kind of quickly go out into very private groups. I think one of the things that you know, I've always had a flipped classroom. So in my classroom, I've always done a lot of different kinds of activities, um, but being able to do that with breakout groups was really neat because you immediately got to a private setting where you could really, um, really work without having all of that background noise and activity happening around you. And being able to step into a group and have a private conversation was fantastic. So for Comp 100, for example, my students were able to do um, the test readings that they would normally do in the classroom together. Um, it worked really well. They could share their screens. They could have a conversation and I could come in and just talk to the two of them. So that was really great and something that you know I definitely want to continue using in some way, even when I'm back in the classroom. Um, in, in academic coaching, you know, I have a unique role on campus being able to kind of hear the perspectives of students, you know, about how collaboration like this went. And I got, you know, some really positive feedback from students about classes that went great. Um, Sarah, your class was actually mentioned a few times with students, you know. I know, I know. Um, 
Um, so, you know, it was really interesting how, you know, some students just loved it, you know, and they, they really found it to be great. Um, but then I also heard the flip side of, you know, students who didn't have a lot of guidelines for collaboration and group activities and teachers who were just kind of like, well, work out your problems. You know, that doesn't happen that easily. Right. And so it was interesting to hear what worked and what didn't work for students. Uh, some really specific activities. I've got my laundry list. I didn't get as creative as you did, Sarah. <laughs> um, but but um, my laundry list, you know, I have different kinds of things that I thought worked great. Um, I did a lot of gallery walks where I would have students present something that they did um, either, you know, write live, you know, in a synchronous class or, you know, on a discussion board and uh, made it a little more low stakes, but got them used to kind of, you know, expressing themselves a little bit more and engaging a little more like that. And that went really well. People like that. Um, I shifted to Ignite Talks instead of regular presentations, and they really liked that idea of an Ignite Talk or a Lightning Talk where you're trying to share your passion for whatever it is you are presenting on. And so that um, within with the with changing this up too to say, you know, you can do it individually, you can do a group presentation, that flexibility and that choice. I think they really love that. Um, and I think they really liked, you know, kind of breaking free from the death by PowerPoint type of presentations. Um, I actually increased my participation grade significantly because I was a little bit concerned when we moved to the online environment about having low participation. And so I actually increased participation and, you know, had to have some sort of evidence of participation in every class, whether that, you know, was a comment in the chat, whether it was speaking up, uh, whether it was, you know, a shared document that we were working on, um, you know, there had to be some sort of interaction so that I didn't have anybody kind of falling asleep in class, which I did actually have happen once during the class. Um, and, uh, you know, and that surprised me at the end of the semester when I realized that that's actually what had happened. So, uh, but for the most part, they all stayed awake. <laughs> um, and then um, community building, you know, that's something that I've kind of always, you know, really felt was really important. But in the online environment, it was really interesting because that I always got to class about 15 minutes ahead of time. And as the students were coming in, you know, I would just have a conversation with with each of them, you know, so what are you up to? You know, how are things going? Do you have any questions? You know, just little things like that. Um, and that, you know, I found that I started having more people come in early mm -hmm. just because they wanted to say hello and they wanted to make that connection. Um, so I think that pre uh, class community building became even more important. And, you know, I want to make sure that I, I keep, you know, room for that. Um, a couple of other little technical things that I loved. Um, I will continue to, you know, anything I do online, I'm going to continue to record those lectures. That was a great reference for everybody to be able to go back to, you know, whether it was something that I did, you know, for them to watch ahead of time or just recording the actual lecture. At first, I thought, oh, I'm just going to record if somebody's absent. Um, but then I realized that it was just helpful in general for them. Um, the thing that I never thought I'd be able to do was great on Blackboard and I ended up loving it. I love the accountability of it. Uh, you can't argue with a timestamp on Blackboard, <laughs> you know, um, you don't lose anything. And so I, you know, that for me is something that even when I get back to the classroom, that's I'm going to continue to use Dropboxes for sure. That was a, a tremendously fantastic thing for me. Uh, and virtual uh, tutoring and academic coaching. You know, we have talked in the Learning Center that that's something that we're going to keep as an option. And, um, you know, and that's something that um, I think the students really appreciated. And I think that will, you know, made it a lot easier in many ways, like for me to be able to have boundaries, you know, and be able to switch quickly from session to session. Um, that was really a huge, huge plus for me too. So, and I see your comment, Sarah, that it was a reluctant love for grading. <laughs> I was in, you know, it was really tough to get there and think that that was gonna work. But, you know, the one thing that little, little tip for me that was great, I mean, I was worried about my eyes and the, you know, tired eyes. And so I ended up hooking up to actually like a TV screen to grade. And so everything was nice and big and that worked out extremely well for me. 
So, um, so I have to say, you know, I learned so much this this pandemic, and I, I want that to continue. You know, I want to make sure that we can keep these kind of interactions and sort of it almost equalize the playing field. Um, you know, being in the position I am as a professional staff member, um, you know, it was nice for me to be able to really interact with a wide variety of colleagues. You know, through these types of connections, and I definitely don't want to lose that. So that's what I have. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. You're welcome. You know, one thing I was thinking about that whole when we're online, you can go into a class 15 minutes early, and it's fine because that's your classroom. Whereas when we're in you know, buildings, a lot of times, it's the strength of the force to count. Yeah. Um, how do we start that type of space? And um, even when we can't be in the classroom for those except for like those seven minutes right because so many people go over just a little bit and then you have seven minutes to get ready for class and everything um so i appreciate you talking about that because yeah, that, that's that is such a great experience to be able to have in this space yeah all right well um we'll transition uh next we have uh beth small so thank you very much beth excellent um, yeah, Kim, that is a couple of things that you said, they're actually sort of things that I was going to be talking about. Um, and it was the the what what to do to lead into the class. Um, um, and I am going to try to do this even even with the awkward, you know, seven minutes of transition, usually less if the other professor takes a while, you know, um, uh, because what I've been doing was I've been playing music starting and i would i would see how long the piece of music was and i would start it so that it would end 30 seconds after the you know if the class was starting at 10 o'clock it would end at 10 and 30 seconds um so that it wouldn't we wouldn't start late but any students who came in early would know that that i was there but not feel obliged to to make conversation because in the classroom this was always been really awkward of the students just sort of sitting there on their phone and me not on my phone just sort of standing there wondering mm -hmm. if people would want to talk to me and so <laughs> um so being able to choose the music then that would relate to the lesson would basically be a way of leading into whatever it is usually a song that had the grammar point that we we're going to study and did you hear the example of the subjunctive in the what our second verse um uh that kind of a thing um um it this spring i had class on the cinco de mayo and and so i you know played my herb alpert Cinco de Mayo song, you know, that kind of thing. Just, uh, just to, so, so that way of starting class, I'm going to try to keep it up. Um, um, yeah, asking the, the students to, to put it away. I've, I've never been able to force that. Um, <laughs> I think I'm not, not forcible enough. Um, so the music is, is, is one way to, to do it. Um, and then you were also talking about marking the essays on Blackboard or homeworks on Blackboard. And yeah, I never liked it. It was all clickety clickety and it felt really slow compared to using red pen. Um, but I'm liking not using paper. Um, and I particularly something about this year, I I discovered the the lovely benefit of being able to erase a comment mm -hmm. <laughs> that I had put onto the paper um, to go back and like, no, no, actually uh, that was right. <laughs> or or no, I didn't explain that well or something like that. So um, um, yeah, not having the stacks of paper. Um, so so I'm liking that. And there's something that I'm going to do. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to sort of take it to the next level, which is the students were not always going back into Blackboard and back into the assignment to see the comments that I put on their papers. Um, even though they're allowed to rewrite their papers in my classes, you know, for additional points, but not everybody does. And so I'm going to learn how to make fillable forms. It's not that hard. Um, and I'm going to set up a form for them to do an analysis of the comments on their essays. Um, you know, cat choose a category of, of error, put in the error, you know, the original sentence and put in a corrected sentence and just do that for like three things on their essay. Just to just to sort of give them a reason to go into the comments and kind of lead them through the process of analyzing their errors. So I think that's like the next the next step for me in in evolving my use of, of the Blackboard comments. Um, 
Um, yeah. So um, let's see. The other things I had were um, I, my textbooks were already online. Um, I used open educational resources in in my Civ course, and I'm going to keep doing that. But I'm really doubling down on the on the online textbooks um, and the and the open resources. It's it's useful in so many ways. The students the students have access to them um, on their devices, and it doesn't really matter what kind of device they have. Um, that it, it doesn't weigh anything more, you know. Um, um, so there's there's just a whole lot of reasons to go. So I'm totally sticking with the online textbook. Um, and then there's one other thing was about assessments um, and exams. So I'm totally going back to giving exam exams. Um, I, I didn't use Respondus, and so I went now a whole year without giving exams. And my students were not learning the material. I, I gave them essays. And the essay doesn't prove that they actually have the information in their head. It just proves that they know how to look it up in order to write it down, right? Um, uh, so I'll keep doing essays um, and I will do exams. But what I did while we were online instead of the exams was to have them do videos to do a more creative project. And I think what I'm going to do going forward is to have them to replace like probably the final essay which is, you know, at the end of the semester, there's no way for them to rewrite it. You know, there's 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 not going to be that that uh, writing process aspect of the final essay um, to, to make that be a creative video, because um, some of the students it was it was sort of boring, but some of the students just had a lot of fun uh, with these essays. Um, you give them a, a, a sorry with these videos, um, give them a sort of a, a variety of prompts um, that range from fun to to boring and and a couple of students like um, choose historical figures and they and they do that thing like they have on YouTube where famous people react to mean tweets or or the frequently asked questions on Google. Um, and so I mean, um, uh, imagining a, a, a Zoom conversation between, you know, historical figures from different time periods, um, that kind of thing. And and the, this, there were a number of students who really sort of found that to be fun. Mm -hmm. And I think for a final essay where it's um, really more about sort of making things converge and having them draw all the points together and, and re, you know, make it their own, um, I'm going to I'm going to stick with that. Um, um, but uh, um, but I have to say I'm I'm not going to I'm I'm not going to continue to not give exams. I'm going I am going to go back to making them actually memorize the map, giving them a blank map and having them actually write it down from out of their own head, because that was that was the the worst part of being online was was not being able to test. The students, um, um, but I think allowing them to be creative in some of these ways, I think I, I do want to make sure that I make space for that going forward. So those were my takeaways. And some of the things I appreciate in there, Beth, was the idea of you know how do you help early on, especially early on in the semester, have your students go back and look at the comments that you that you made on there, right? So we I know some other people throughout this year talked about that of either on the first couple of assignments have them either fill out a form or something that says, hey, what were your two biggest takeaways from my comments yeah. or something like that? There's like, OK, you, oh, you don't know where the comments are. OK, let's make sure you know where the comments are so you can get there. So I really like that idea of how do we help guide them back to find that information that we've taken time to give to them so they can use that for moving forward. So um, we, we can help you with the fillable forms, Beth. Don't do it. Don't like there are better online forms than fillable forms at this point. So come to us and talk to us about that. So we'll touch. Okay. Back. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted, just wanted to throw that out there. All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. And uh, next we have uh, Kathy Spetsoff. So Kathy, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, so I was going to just sort of show how I organized my materials on, on Blackboard. So I think I can share my window, right? Let's see. Um, Let's see, not sure what you're seeing. Uh, 
Right now we are seeing um, Sarah's assignment case study discussions. Oops, yeah. no, that was Sarah's. <laughs> are, are you seeing intro to graphics and imaging? No. So I think you just shared the that that specific thing instead of your screen. Oh, so if you want to okay, unshare. Exactly. Let's see. And then share your full screen instead of a specific window. It should be at the far left hand side. And now are you seeing it? Yes. OK. All right, so this is my intro class to graphics and imaging. And something that the students told me was helpful to them, and I'm not sure if everyone does this or not, but I make a weekly to-do list. Because one of the things I found with teaching online is how to break up the stuff. Do you want to break up the stuff by subject or, you know, and I found that by breaking it up by the week. So we start with week one. And I'm literally telling them that each of these things should be accomplished by the end of the week. And I've also taught as a flipped classroom for quite a number of semesters, but now it became like a totally flipped where I recorded each of my lectures. And I have them on stream so they could just click on this link and they would watch my intro video and then they would watch you know the video how to do part a now this is a graphics and imaging class so i'm teaching them software and it's all project based so they needed to watch my video and i would sort of talk them through the various steps of a project and um the the students did respond to this well one of the things that I did learn um, is that there will be certain students who will not watch the video and decide to just try to wing it. And, you know, <laughs> they, they just like to do things the hard way. Um, so sort of somewhere partway through, I have like each week of the semester here. I learned that if I sort of try to create it as more of clickbait <laughs> where I name the video or tell them like learn this like all of a sudden it seemed like my statistics were going up for how many students <laughs> watched the thing and you know it, it just sort of was like I knew this all along but I wasn't using it you have to make it attractive or you have to make it seem essential or exciting so that was another little hint um, that they, they started why or else they just realized, hey, this is how this class is going to work. She's not going to lecture during the class. We have to watch the videos. And once they got in the routine, it did really work out. And also, like you, you can't argue with the date stamp on Blackboard, as you said, but uh, that but you also can't argue with when things were due. You know, if, if they said, oh, but I thought it was, you know, no, it's right here on the checklist. And I also um, have a calendar that I use extensively. Um, so I have this all under staying organized. So here's my weekly to do list and right underneath it is the calendar. And the only little thing and it kind of goes against my principles to have dates in two places because you're bound to mess up now and then. But um, this way, those who wanted to see it more visually, the um, each thing was here. So when you had to start on a project, when you were working on a project, when was the last day to work on the project, when the files are due. So it, I, I, I found this to help both me and the students, you know. So under the staying organized, we had the weekly to do list, the calendar, uh, their grades. And then this was another thing, and I'm sure um, quite a few people did this, but I, I was pleasantly surprised at how well it worked. I created groups, just four groups out of the class, and I introduced it right in the first week. And what I used these groups for was for each of the, there was seven projects during the course of the semester. So halfway through each project, I told them what class and what time during the class they had to go into their group and share their in progress project. 
And what I found was like some students were stronger in software, some were stronger in drawing and the creative aspect of the project. Um, but they were, as someone else mentioned, they were more at ease asking certain questions to the other students, you know. And I even remember overhearing one saying, what did she mean by like as if, you know, <laughs> and, and so I felt comfortable that it wasn't just me it, it was they were sharing with each other and then i noticed that at the end of each project i had a um critique you know a discussion critique and the little group that had formed by me breaking them up into groups um they were responding to each other's posts more in the discussion critique so you know, they were, uh, there was a discussion for each thing. And again, I give them prompts. So I tell them what to post. And then I say, you know, tell us what decisions you made in order to visually describe three zones of space. Um, you know, I give them prompts. But they would respond more to the students in their group because they felt comfortable with them. They felt like they had a little tiny learning community, um, which seemed to work pretty well. Um, one of the things that I will keep in the future is a chat box or a chat column, even when I'm in the classroom. And one of the reasons I feel that there are certain students who would just prefer to type things um, and not raise their hand in class or not speak up. And it was also sort of something for me to observe. Um, I, I felt as though it was just another insight that I had into the class. So I will keep a, a chat going. I don't know if other people feel that way. One thing I'm kind of wondering is when I'm back in the classroom, even though I did the flipped classroom before um, we taught online, what am I gonna do with all these videos I made? <laughs> Am I going to just like stand at the uh, lectern there and, and just like play my video of me? I don't know. It's like I got all these videos now. Uh, and some of them I went back in and edited like where I really blew things up to show them different tools. So it's almost like a better thing than what I can display in front, you know. So I got to think about that over the summer. Um, am I going to just have them available? I don't know. I'm, maybe other people have some ideas, right? Yeah, I'm I'm ready to flip my classroom entirely. Yeah, I am. And that way it actually works well because we are so project based that they can be working at their computers and I can spend more time. I mean, I, you know, it just and that way if they don't remember something when they're on their own, they can refer back. Um, let's see. One little tool that I, I'm sort of like an evangelist for this online tool. And so I just want to make sure people know about it. It's called LinkedIn Learning. It used to be called lynda.com and LinkedIn purchased it. You can get it free through the New York City library system. I think you can, can you also get it through the Milner Library? I believe you might be able to, but um, you can get a digital New York City library card for free. You don't even have to take Amtrak. And when you have your digital card, you have access to like, there's like thousands of videos for many, many different things. But for me, what I use is the videos on Adobe software. Um, but I find myself, you know, recently I had to build, it's like a Facebook event page for something uh, where you can send out it. And I was like, how do you do this? I just, I just went on LinkedIn learning. And in a moment I had an expert explaining exactly how to do it. So um, that I made use of, I've been using it for years uh, for teaching the software, but um, I, I'm going to continue using that. It's really extremely helpful. Um, one thing I'm investigating, and it's been a frustration I had with Stream, is that you cannot see which student watched which video or for how long. And that, you know, I've been I've been actually on one of those pages where Microsoft wants to know what you would like from them. And I've been complaining as loud as I could. But um, 
Edpuzzle is a tool that you can purchase a subscription to. They, I think they're for free. You can have a certain number of videos, but I'm going to need. Uh, but that is um, something where you get the statistics. You create a class and you can see each student what they've watched. And you can even insert quiz questions into the video, which I know you can on stream as well. Um, but you can insert quiz questions and then just get your quizzes and your video all wrapped up in one thing. So I think I'm, I don't, I don't know, it's one of my goals for this summer. So anyway, that's what I was going to show you. So I guess I should stop sharing. Am I still sharing my screen? No, no, okay. So um, that, that was what I was hoping to show you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, you're uh welcome. There was, you'll have to go back through the chat because there were some great, um, when you talked about video titles as clickbait, um, there were some really great titles that came up in the chat. So you'll want to go back and uh, be right. able to revisit those if you didn't get to see them while they were going on. Right. I'll do that. <laughs> there was a healthy conversation, at, which I love. And it's a great point. Like, you know, you post these videos and think they're going to watch them. You're like, oh, like, unless you can frame them in the right way of like, this is an important thing that you need to watch in order to do this. Um, I think it was Sarah kind of got at that with one of her titles, like, this, you need to, this video to pass this class. Watch it now, right? Um, like, unless you can frame it in a way where you're like, oh, this is useful for this reason. And I think that's a really great point. Uh, we, we put these videos up like, oh, they're just going to watch them. And we, just like everything, we need to give them a reason to watch it. And so that <laughs> I, I, I was one of the first things I wrote down was video is clickbait. That's it. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I, did. I learned that the first video, if I just say, this is how to start this project. And that made them so happy because they're always like so confused at the beginning. And just to give them that first stepping stone, they're like, oh, OK, great. You know, I can do this. I did have a student last fall say to me, um, I even watched the video and I'm confused. And I'm like, OK, that was too much information. <laughs> So you haven't been watching them till now. Huh? <laughs> okay, interesting. Oh dear. Well, first I want to say thank you again to our presenters um, for sharing your thoughts for today. And we'd like to kind of open it up now, either to um, any questions or thoughts you might have. Um, that there was a lot that was thrown out, Kathy, about going completely flipped with since you have all these videos and um, how you can really use your time in the classroom for that. Um, and uh, so just want to open this up now. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or other things that you would like to add? Um, other takeaways you've had from this semester that you think really worked well that you would love to keep? <laughs> and and I saw has anybody been putting quiz questions within the videos? And are you doing it in stream, Sarah? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yes. And I, it wasn't difficult to learn how to do it. It was a really low barrier to entry. I just went in there and started messing around and figured it out on the first day of class when I realized, oh, crap, I said I would do this and never figured out how to do it. Great. <laughs> this is the perfect time to mm -hmm. see if I can do it. So um, and it, it, you know, it took me like an hour to really get it down. It wasn't that bad. Um, I will say that there were students who, like there was a student, for example, at the end of my fashion journalism class who was like, at the end, she was like, oh my God, I just realized that there were forms in the videos and I never responded to them. And I was like, yeah, that was especially fun because I got tired of the emails about the forms not working. And so I put right at the bottom of every video, it was like form not working, click here to open it in a new browser. And so, you know, she was then also curious why she got a C. I was like, well, I could maybe make a few suggestions. So um, so that was my experience with them. Uh, one thing I liked about it is you can track them. So I had some participation points based on that. Uh, and this semester, again, I had a pretty shoddy turnout on the asynchronous class that I, I had one hybrid asynchronous class with the synchronous component and there were some students that did not do their forms and yeah yeah I, I, yeah exactly tim and then and then wondered why they had done poorly so 
So there is that. Mm -hmm. Mixed results. And also, Kathy, I've struggled with that because I put videos up and, and even so, even if I could get tracking information, OK, this student watched this video for 20 minutes. Does that mean that they sat there in front of their video, their their screen the whole time and actually watched it or they hit play and they walked out of the room and did three other things and then came back and hit play, right? And so I, I do like the idea of it, having students engage with it through questions in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Explored lots of ways of either having like a quiz after it um, so that you can answer the questions based off of that, but it's, a, it's still it's a blackboard quiz so that sometimes they can they might be able to see those more easily. I think we're still kind of working through, as Sarah said, helping to make sure students always know that those forms are in the middle of those. Because um, I can't remember, like, if if the video if the questions are like at, at two minutes and thirty seconds in the video and they start and they jump to four minutes into the video, does it let them know they skipped over a form, right? So they might not even know that if they've jumped to a certain point in the video and things like that. So that's that's some of the stuff that that we need to kind of figure out as well with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably could have used them more effectively, you know, like generally they were at the end of a video, um, that kind of thing, or towards the end. They, I found them better when they were sort of embedded, when there was, especially if there was multiple forms in the same video, so it would stop, mm -hmm. make them do a thing. Um, hey, remember you're watching a thing? Get off your phone. Like, I, I, I think that was probably pretty helpful. I know for me, I was always distracted, so I can't blame them for always being distracted. The best I can do is try and bring them back in. Yeah. You know, and I'm just kind of thinking this out loud now. I think it might be worthwhile if you're going to do that to, before they even go to the link, be able to say, hey, I have embedded a form in here. There's one at the end of the video or there's one about halfway through the video. So I, I think like always our students work better when there's uh, predictability inside of it. So if they know that there's something that they knew, need to do beforehand, I think when we surprise them and, and kind of do those gotcha videos in the middle, I think is sometimes where that gets to struggle, struggling a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I found my students really, like, so I had like a little statement below every video, like video form not working, click here. It just became standard. And then if there was no form in the video, it just said there are no forms in this video. Nice. Nice. So they they knew, you know, yeah. there's nothing missing. I'm not trying to trick them. <laughs> and so yeah, I agree. The predictability I think was was really key. And that I think that was something, Catherine, that you mentioned. Um, having those weekly checklists. Yeah. First semester, my students loved them. <laughs> Second semester, my students often didn't use them. So I was a little conflicted. I found <laughs> there was a big change on how students interacted with my course. Maybe it was me, I don't know, but um, yeah. My BS tolerance went way down in the spring. Right. Understand and this is being recorded, great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, at minute 56, we will edit for you. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely going to stick with videos. It's something that I had wanted to do and just never had like the wherewithal. And now it's like, okay, now I know how to make this. My big issue is, is that I had made them and they're funky. Oh my God. In my home studio for the ones, cause we were printmaking at home, but now I'm going to be in the studio. I'm going to work with, um, our instructional support technician and they're still going to be super short, but I'm going to work with them for the, because inevitably somebody misses when I do a demo and then I have to make a time with them to show them the demo again. No, 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 no. I can't do this when I've got three students who miss how to do an aquatint. That's another couple of hours for me. Oh my God. Like, and then like, oh, and I couldn't make it that day. I'm like, okay, I plan the time for you and you, okay, here we go again. So yeah, the videos are, are staying. I'm just going to have to make more, but Oh my God, to have them, I've had students say, yeah, I went back and I went, oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Kim, I see you hopped on. Did you want to add something in? No, I just realized, I just realized my camera was still off after the presentation part. And I was like, I can't turn it on. That but I was actually typing something, so I can just say it. I was going to say also, like, I like the videos because then you notice different. It's like when you're in the middle of working on that Aquatint project, there might be some things like, what did she say about that? Like three, four, five days ago, a week ago. And you didn't have that question before. So, like, I find a lot of times when I tell students things, it's still going over their head. 
but I still say it because I'm like, I want to say all the things, but it's going over their heads. So then that way, if it's in the video, they have a chance to go back and be like, oh, this is what you meant when you said that thing that I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about, lady. And I'm like, yeah, that thing. And they're like, oh, great. So I think that's another reason to like have videos for those key things that you want them to be able to reference. And that's nice. Oh, yeah. And I actually had a, a professor, this was a couple of years ago when I thought, oh my God, I need to do this. And I didn't. He said he has found videos on the internet and has them either research them or finds them himself. And then when he does the demo in class, he's like, okay, what's different? Why? Um, that's a great idea. Yeah. Because this I'm like, so I see, I, I made all of my own because I'm like, okay, you're teaching them to do this. I do not want them to do that. I don't want them to do that. I don't want them. Okay. No, I'm doing this myself. And we can like, and then I've got students who got go do research anyways. And they're like, how come you do it like this? I'm like, oh, excellent question. This is why, you know, like that's good, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, it makes them responsible for knowing and noticing and asking questions. It's like, wait a minute, you did it that way that time and you've done it this way this time. Mm -hmm. I'm so pleased you're paying attention. Let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Any other thoughts or questions? It's getting windy out here on the water. <laughs> 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 rough seas huh <laughs> i guess i had a i had one more fun thing like on my on my laundry list of scribbles of things that i could have shared my brainstorming um i don't know if anybody else did this but i found it so easy to bring in so much easier to bring in guest speakers this year mm -hmm. um so much so that i was able to develop an entire class project around a guest speaker mm -hmm which was awesome and they came multiple times like an in like a real industry person from like a global brand my students mo most of them loved it <laughs> so, we'll see. but um one one thing that i thought i'd mention and i guess this comes from that mindset piece that i'm really trying to take with me was you know when i used to have guest speakers come in via skype before or um uh uh when I used to have a speaker come in via Skype or Zoom, there was always that anxiety before the meeting, like, is it going to work? Do I need to call IT now or <laughs> or when the problem happens? You know, like, is the volume going to work in the room? And now it's like, oh, I tune into a video call eight times a day. Boop, no problem. And everybody else is comfortable with it, too. And we've all learned all these different platforms as well, right? So I can Zoom, I can Skype, I can Teams. Most of your guest speakers can, too, and figure it out. Uh, so, so that's that. Uh, Rhea, to answer your question, how did I compensate the speaker? Uh, good vibes and emojis, I, you know, I, I, favors, love, affection. I, I, I sent a really nice, or I or organized a nice gift bag for one of my guest speakers, for the one who was the whole semester. And I sent interns to a couple others. So actually, I guess I did compensate them. There you go. Yeah, you did. Yeah, because I find that artists get asked so often to do things for free that I really hesitate unless I can trade. Like you come to my class and I'll go to yours. I don't have a problem with that. Totally. But to come to show up multiple times or somebody that's a cold call uh, makes me nervous. It's funny you say that because I was literally just saying that at the last week of school to my students in my fashion entrepreneurship class. I was like, do not go to all your photography friends and ask them to shoot your lookbooks for you for free. Like they paid for those skills and they should be compensated just like you wouldn't work for free, develop a merchandising plan, you know? And they were like, oh, I never thought about it that way. So <laughs> talking out two sides of my mouth here, Rhea, because I definitely did just ask people um, to do that, you know, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I do think that I have favors to offer. I know the good interns, you know, <laughs> I got them. So hopefully that'll be. When Ed, Ed's put in the chat too, like th there were some press releases put out about it. So they both you and the company got some good press releases out of it as well, correct? Yes, uh, me, 
the SUNY Oneonta Puma, it was P Puma was the brand that he worked for, or works for. Um, so we all got lots of positive press. Some of my students were interviewed for articles at like their local newspapers and stuff. So there was a lot of press and buzz. I got my first Google alert for my name, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, I guess the other piece of that that I should mention was Scott asked me, like he wanted this a bad so and he's still getting paid at puma for the time he spent with us so uh, you know he i think he really wanted to give back as an mm -hmm. alum he really wanted to give back so i i think that there was that inclusion piece and that's why i say like good vibes and love and like affection you know i meant for him too to interact with our students cool I did, but I, I think that's the point is worth saying of like, it's good to think about, you know, are, are we taking it? I'm with Rhea, we don't want to make, we don't want to make sure we're taking advantage or like all of a sudden lumping on that one person all the time because they did this. Um, and how can we either spread it around or create a, a larger network to help you find those people to continue doing that? So it's not always um, a, a, a burden on somebody or anything like that. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'd also offer that like all of us here today said yes to a talk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't think I'm getting an extra check for this, but if I am, that's great. But I, I you know, I realize it's part of my job as a faculty to be involved mm -hmm. in things, but uh, there are a lot of faculty who are not involved in things like this and make the same or more than I do. So, um, so you know, there is, there is value in just giving back. Yes. If you want to. <laughs> Well, it is kind of a pay it forward. The more you give out sometimes, the more you get back. You know what I mean? Like if it starts with you, it often comes back round in a nice way. So maybe they're just missing out. <laughs> you know, I belong to a, a Slack group uh, for the upstate AIGA. It's the American Industry of Graphic Arts. And every now and then I just go in and, you know, but every now and then someone is looking for someone to do something. Mm -hmm. And it is a point of pride to give back to the industry, you know, especially when you, you know, you, you've been at it for many years and you sort of feel as though you have something to offer and you're grateful for the, you know, for having made a living in it. So, um, yeah, and I don't know if there's Slack organization, you know, Slack groups for every type of thing, but that works pretty well people can find each other on there yeah all right well i want to say thank you one more time beth i'm putting one of my favorite maps into the chat right now um this is from a xkcd comic i don't know if anybody knows xkcd but he does maps all the time but when you're speaking about your test with um with uh, south american maps it made me think of this one so i had to uh share this one it's not the, even the full map it's just the, the the south american portion of the full world map so if you i can put the link in if you want to see the, the full comic but it's you can click on that to make it larger if you want but it just it, it made me think of that map when you're like oh yeah i'm i this is probably about how i would answer it for all the countries in south america right now if i had to so the rest <laughs> <laughs> so i'll be truly honest those three little countries at the top of brazil I'm like, yeah, there's those three little countries. That's what they're called. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I so. added a very fun video for anybody who wants to watch it, too. For a video prompt, I was inspired by your video prompt idea. I put it in there. If anybody wants to watch it, it made me squeal in delight from the first Excellent. moment. So if you okay. feel like a giggle or just some cool student work, it's a minute and a half. So. Perfect. That's my length. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much and have a great afternoon. And again, thank you to our presenter today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time um, out of your busy schedules to be able to do that. So we appreciate you sharing with us today.